Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Life is hard. Pain and difficulty come our way. Things don't always go the way we'd like. Well, does God have plans in all of this? Well, absolutely. And in today's podcast, we're going to study the second half of Romans chapter 8. We're going to see the depth of God's love for us, the suffering that His Son went through for us, and how there will be times when our lives mirror His suffering, but God has a redemptive plan for all of this. And so, welcome to our Key Chapters podcast. I am Russ Brewer, pastor at Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado, and it is a privilege to have you joining with us today. And so today we're looking at the second half of Romans 8, specifically looking at verses 18 to 39. Now, before we jump into today's study, let me just say thank you for being part of this ongoing study. It is truly a privilege to have you part of this podcast series. And my hope and my prayer is that you are growing in greater love for our Lord and a deeper understanding of His Word. And so thanks for being a part of it. And with that, let's get to work. We've got a lot to work through in this passage here. As I've already mentioned, this is part two of our study in Romans 8. Yesterday, we discussed the first half of Romans 8, where we looked at how the Holy Spirit crucifies sin in our life so that we might fully serve Him. And so the first half of Romans 8 really comes on the heels of a long, extended discussion about salvation. And just Paul's been talking about how we receive this righteousness of God by grace through faith. And then in chapter 6 to 8, Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit then uses this righteousness to produce transformation in our life and just giving us victory over sin. And so now as we turn to verse 18, we're going to find out that this transformation is not only for our own good, it's not only for God's glory, but it serves as a witness to the world about the transforming power of God and the redemption that he has promised to this world. So let's start today's podcast going into verse 18. Verse 18 says, Logizime garati uk azia patimata. <laughs> Wait, sorry, still have my Greek open here. Let me get to the English here. Uh, The English in verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so this might seem like there's a shift in Paul's focus, but this shift is really just continuing to unpack a long line of reasoning that Paul has been unfolding from the beginning of this book. You'll remember that the section just before we were reading yesterday is talking about how we are adopted into God's family. And just before that, Paul was talking about how the Holy Spirit crucifies our sin. And the major section that precedes that is how God gives us true righteousness through faith and how nothing we can do on our own will produce this kind of righteousness. And so now Paul is showing us how all of this transformation is for us to be a witness to the world about the redemptive work of the gospel. And so to get there to that point, Paul then just takes this pathway talking about the suffering that he has faced and how compared to the glory that we will receive, this suffering, it's nothing. It's not a whole lot. And so let's follow Paul's line of reasoning here. Suffering, of course, was something Paul was very familiar with. You'll remember that Paul was probably writing this letter to Rome from Corinth in the early part of what was Acts 20. Paul had already been beaten at this point numerous times. He was thought to have been killed by a crowd in Lystra. He uh, sort of started a riot in the city of Ephesus just a few months earlier in Acts 19. And so Paul is no stranger to suffering. But he's showing us here that this suffering serves to highlight God's promises of redemption to the world. You see, the hatred and persecution that Paul faced as he proclaimed the word of God just shows how the world hates the things of God. And people were acting according to their nature. And so the next set of verses is going to show us that this is more or less par for the course as long as we're in this sin-cursed world. And so in verse 19, Paul says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, in verse 19, Paul personifies creation to say that creation is anxiously longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, what is this? What is he talking about? Well, the revealing of the sons of God, well, that's just one of the events that will occur when Christ returns to establish his kingdom. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But for now, we need to see that suffering and pain are part of a cursed creation But there is coming a day when the Lord will do away with this cursed creation and establish one where there is no curse, there is no suffering, there is no pain. And so, going on to verse 20, Paul says that right now, creation is subjected to futility. That means things don't really work right right now. 
We see this all around us. We even have names for it, like the second law of thermodynamics, which talks about equilibrium and entropy and how things just can't keep running the way they are. They're eventually going to give out and go kaput. And so God has subjected creation to this futility. And if you want to take a rabbit trail about why, then I would encourage you to listen to the Genesis 3 podcast because that podcast explains the purpose of death, which in a nutshell is to give us an exit from this cursed creation that is separate from God. Going back here in Romans 8, at the end of verse 20, Paul says that God subjected creation to this futility in hope. And the hope in verse 21 is that even creation will be set free from this slavery to corruption, and it too will enjoy the freedom and the glory of the children of God. That's amazing. But we got to pause for a moment and just see how all of this fits into the river of truth that's been flowing through the Bible all the way back to Genesis 3. Going back to Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, God told them that he would send a Redeemer to fix this, to fix the mess that they created. Job was looking forward to this Redeemer taking his stand on the earth in Job 19. In Genesis 12 and 16, God told Abraham that this Redeemer would be one of his, as in Abraham's descendants, uh, through Jacob in Genesis 49. God told the world that this Redeemer would be a king and a descendant of Judah. In 2 Samuel 7, God told David that this Redeemer would be one of his descendants and would be an eternal king. Through Daniel and Daniel 2, and, and really throughout Daniel 7 to 12, God showed that this king and his kingdom would be established at the end of time and spread across this world. Then Jesus comes on the scene and he is the messianic king and he fulfills countless prophecies and he performs countless miracles, all to show that he was indeed this prophesied redeemer. And then he inaugurates his kingdom with his life and death and resurrection. And upon his resurrection, he is the first fruits of his kingdom and we are too. And now here in Romans 8, Paul is tying all of these ideas together and talking about the day of redemption that all creation is looking forward to when Jesus will return to establish his kingdom. And so the book of Romans has been really unpacking the individual transformation that each citizen of this kingdom undergoes. And here in verse 23, we have this incredibly important verse that we might miss if we don't pause to look at it. But in verse 23, Paul says we are first fruits of the Spirit. Now, pausing for a moment, what does that mean? It means that we are first fruits of this redemptive kingdom that's still to come. And it means that our purpose in this world is to stand as living witnesses to the world around us, that just as God has transformed you and I through the gospel, we're the first fruit samples of the total transformation, the total redemptive work that God will bring to this world when he establishes his kingdom here on earth. And so Paul's point in verses 23 to 25 is that although we're suffering in this world, we know that God has a redemptive purpose for it, and we're putting our complete hope in the work and the plan of God, knowing that we're the first fruits of his transforming grace, and our ability to endure suffering and persecution is the very stuff that points this world to the power of God. And so that's good stuff there. Uh, we could just pause and just think about this. That's our purpose in this world, to be pointing the world to the Lord. And when we face and endure suffering and persecution, all of that is just bearing testimony to the transforming grace and power of God because he gives us transforming grace to withstand that right then and there. And that only points to the transforming grace that he will be bringing to this world one day when he establishes his kingdom. So again, that's good stuff, but we got a lot more to get through in this chapter. So let's keep going to verses 26 to 27, which gives us yet another blessing of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So far, we've seen the Holy Spirit's role in our life. He's, he gives us faith. He crucifies sin in our life. He enables us to live out holy lives in Christ. And now here, we're seeing he also helps us in our prayers. And so Paul says in verses 26 and 27, he says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so Paul recognizes that God's work and God's plan for our lives is something of a mystery. Half the time, we don't really know how we're supposed to pray. Are we supposed to pray for the persecution to end? Are we supposed to pray that it would continue so we could persevere and glorify God through it? We don't know, but God does. And so we just need to spend time with the Lord in prayer, knowing that he will guide us to a path that is glorifying to him as he is accomplishing and fulfilling his will in our lives. And so now we come to then one of the most famous passages in the book of Romans, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28, familiar verse, it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so again, in the context about how the Lord is using us as beacons of hope in a darkened world and how our ability to endure persecution bears witness to the reality of our faith, in all of that, we know that God has a redemptive plan. He knows what he's doing with our lives and we can trust him in it. In fact, Paul goes on to say that whatever we're going through has been part of God's plan all along. And so Paul says in verse 29, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that we would be firstborn, again, there's that idea, among many brethren. And so this idea here, to to foreknow is to know beforehand. And and God knew us before we came to faith in Christ. God even knew us before we came to exist. He knows all things and he's always known about us. Not only that, God has predestined us to become conformed to the image of his Son. This wasn't an afterthought. God has been planning this out all along. If you are a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, then he chose you before any of this. And he said, okay, I'm going to use so-and-so, whatever your name might be. I'm going to use so-and-so to be a living witness of my transforming grace. And so his plan for you is that you would be conformed to Christ's likeness. Sometimes you wonder, what's God's will for my life? Well, no matter what it entails, It always is to specifically transform you to reflect the life and death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, resurrection, of course, will be in the end times, but we are to be conformed to Jesus Christ. And that then becomes the purpose for everything that Paul has been laying out in the past eight chapters. And so verse 30 then reads like a review of what we've already been covering throughout these last eight chapters. Paul says in verse 30, And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. These whom he justified, he also glorified. And so, if God has predestined you, he has called you. You heard his voice and you came to him in faith. When you came to him in faith, he justified you and made you completely and truly righteous in Christ. And now that you are truly righteous in Christ, We saw yesterday in the first half of Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit transforms you to live out that righteousness through sanctification, and that will ultimately culminate in glory. And so the second half of Romans 8 shows us that this righteousness is how we shine for the gospel of the glory of the King in the midst of this darkened world around us and how we bear witness to the world of the transforming work that he will one day bring to this whole world. Now that's, again, huge stuff, but we got more to go through So let's go on to verse 31. In verse 31, Paul then wants us to see that if these spiritual realities are true, then what is there to worry about? If God is for us, who can be against us? Everything that God is doing is according to his grand plan. When we receive blessings, it is for his glory. When we receive persecution or suffering, it's still for his glory. He has a redemptive purpose for everything he allows into our lives. And so Paul says in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, Paul's saying, listen, folks, God will give us everything we need to accomplish his will. If you think you need something, don't sweat it. God will give you what you need to testify of his transforming grace so the world will see this glimmer of transforming redemption in your life that is the same kind of transformation that he will one day bring to this whole world. And so the world may war against us, but we have nothing to worry about. We see this in verses 33 and 34. Again, just wonderful verses here. Paul says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Paul's basically saying, there's no condemnation. Remember Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because we've been truly and fully justified and made righteous. And so in verse 34, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And someone might think they can level a charge against us. Uh Uh-uh. Christ is for us. He's with the Father. He's interceding for us. He loves us. And he won't let anything happen to us that is outside of his redemptive plan for us. No matter what we've gone through, no matter what we're going to go through, the Lord will give us the grace to turn that situation on its head and bring him glory and bear witness of his transforming power and grace. And so then Paul ends with this amazing passage of Christ's love. And Paul says in verses 35 to 39, he says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Going on to verse 36, Just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
Again, Paul knows suffering. He knows what it's like to face death for the gospel. And yet Paul says in verse 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We might be suffering right now, but in Christ and through prayer, where we're trusting in the Holy Spirit to help us to pray and where we're trusting in the intercessory work of Christ, we know we're going to be okay. And we're looking forward to God's eternal plan and our place as his children in his kingdom. And we are putting our hope and our trust in our King. So that's Romans 8. So many great truths in this passage here. We have to just end it here. I know that was quick. It's a great chapter. Let's just kind of reflect on these things throughout our day. Let's live these principles out in the world around us that we might bear witness and that we might live as bright lights shining for the gospel of grace. We'll end things there. Thanks so much for listening. And we'll catch you tomorrow as we go to Romans chapter 9. Until then, have a great day and God bless.